So, um, as I mentioned, we're talking about the spirit of Babylon tonight. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna be coming out of Isaiah chapter thirteen and Isaiah chapter fourteen. Um, a lot of what we're gonna look at is gonna come out of Isaiah chapter thirteen first and kind of segue into Isaiah fourteen. Um, and the reason why I feel like the Father kind of wanted to highlight this aspect is when I was reading. I know we've talked a lot about this aspect of the remnant body of Christ. We know that the Most High God is 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 gathering the scattered remnant of Israel, and we also know that He's gathering the remnant of the Gentile nations and bringing everyone on one accord um, in these times that we live in. And so this this aspect of this remnant has constantly been echoed throughout the earth. You hear everybody regardless of denomination or whatever, constantly talking about this. And then it's interesting because as I was studying and, and reading through Isaiah 13 and 14, I started seeing the word remnant again. But in this aspect, this it was coming from this concept of this remnant of, of these Babylon of the of Babylon, right? This remnant of the individuals that the most high said is in a, in opposition to his kingdom and pretty much are at odds with him. So I found that interesting because it gives me, it gave me clear clarity and understanding and insight as to why you would hear so many people saying the same type of language and speaking to the same thing, even though what their walk looks like is, is completely different. And I'm not talking about believers and followers of Christ in the body of Christ, but I'm talking about how you can have individuals who have no relationship with the Father still echoing the same thing. Right. So I was curious to that. And I think this is kind of what gave insight to that, because when we talk about Babylon, there's a lot of people who do a lot of studies on, on prophecy and, and they want to get into a lot of different things to try to see, you know, which nation represents Babylon in these days and different things like that. But a lot of times, as we've talked about before, people can get so far into looking at the natural or the physical that they forget about the spirit that's operating behind what it is we're being presented with. So the Most High always gives us a physical example to help us understand what is otherwise happening in the spirit, right? So we understand that when it, even when it deals with the law of God, there's a letter aspect and there's a spirit behind that letter, right? We know when the individual is moving and operating in the earth, they're moving and operating in the natural, but we see a spirit. There's always a spirit that is influencing the individual behind the scenes as well, right? We and, and how Christ dealt with Peter. When Peter spoke something contrary to what Christ knew was the will of God, then he, he addressed him and said, get thee behind me. And he addressed the spirit that was operating behind Peter at that time, in that moment, right? So when we're talking about this spirit of Babylon, it's, it's, it's important to recognize this aspect because if there is a if there is this, this Babylonic spirit that is in operation and throughout the earth, then we need to know its characteristics and we really we really need to understand what it looks like right because we can focus on so many different things but i believe there's power in understanding and being able to properly articulate what is actually happening right there's there's an mm -hmm. ability to guard yourself when you know what's going on there's a there's a resistance that you have to the schemes of the enemy if you know he's scheming Right. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if someone is trying to run game on you and you recognize the game they're trying to run it, how effective is that game going to be? Right. Mm -hmm. So in this time that we're living, the one thing that I feel like the most I really desires for his children and for his people to move with is wisdom and wisdom that's rooted in knowledge of who he is. And also wisdom that's rooted in knowledge that is not. That is not ignorant of the devices of the enemy. Right. Mm -hmm. Amen. So some key things we're going to talk about. Um, tonight is we're going to talk about who who and what is Babylon. We're going to talk about recognizing the spirit by its fruits. We're going to look into this concept as far as being in instruments of war, right? As it's outlined in I Isaiah um, chapter 13. Oh, wow. And then we're going to look at this aspect of discerning the seasons, Middle East considerations with all of this uh, as it deals with prophecy and just kind of have some final thoughts, right? Mm -hmm. um, but for those of you, if this is your first time, or for those who may have been, um, it's been a while. Um, our mission, this is Seven Seal Remnant. Um, we are we are supporting the work of the Most High God of Israel and gathering the remnant in these prophetic days. You can learn about that in Ezekiel 11, Jeremiah 23, and Micah 4. We're diverse, multi-generational, 
international virtual church community united with the purpose of spreading the doctrine of Christ and the gospel of the kingdom that unifies believers in spirit and truth. We're established on biblical truth, purity, and accuracy and are pursuing the heart of the Father to bring the church on one accord. And our vision is gathering the remnant, restoring the faith, and unifying believers. It was prophesied that in these last days he will pour his spirit out on all flesh and that the gospel of the kingdom must be preached to the ends of the earth. We believe this gathering and outpouring to be what the Bible said it is, the harvest of the remnant. We're a middle ground ministry that bridges the gaps of faith and doctrine as believers seek to understand core principles essential to faith in Christ. All right. So before we get into Isaiah and start to read, and I want us to look at some of these 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 definitions as far as Babylon, right? Who is Babylon? What is Babylon? Right. So as I was looking into the word and the definitions um, in the concordance about Babylon, right, because we know there's a historical aspect where there's a physical location. There is a, a, a real life empire that was called Babylon. There was a new Babylon that existed. Um, which as prophesied the judgment of, of the father was released against it and you know those physical empires collapsed at some point or they transitioned into something different right but you have to ask yourself when it comes to these names right what what is the purpose of these names because there's there's no such thing as a name that doesn't have meaning i mean like language is used to divine is, is used to define something it helps us articulate a thing right so you might have some individuals that have a name where it, it may not seem like it has meaning or it may not make sense to you. But if you talk to them or their parents or whatever and you ask them, you know, why they came up with the name, there's always a reason behind the name. So the name that you hear, the name that's articulated, there's there's something underlying as far as what their name means. Right. If that makes sense. So when you're looking at this, this word Babylon, right, Babylon actually comes from the word Babel. Right. And then when you look at the word Babel, Babel actually comes from the word Bilal. When you get into the, the, the Hebrew roots of all of these different words, right? The, the Hebrew etymology of Babylon, it goes to Babel, which furthermore goes to Bilal. Right. Which is important to understand because a lot of people don't know that. But when you deal with Babel, right, Babel or Babylon, it, it literally means confusion Right. But in a context of this word confusion, it's it, it means confusion by mixing. Right. So the physical aspect of Babel or Babylon is the ancient site and or capital of Babylonia. Right. Situated on the Euphrates. But when you deal with the definition and the etymology of the word, it means confusion. Right. And so you have to understand that. And we see this same thing in Genesis chapter 11, verses one through nine. It says, and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, go, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name. Lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they will all have one language. And this they began to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to let us go down, and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from the dense upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Right? This is this is interesting, right? It it helps us get context as far as the it helps us get context as far as as far as how we see the word and stuff employed. But one thing I found that was interesting too is is this this habit that the father has of scattering people, right? It's 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 interesting when he scatters people. I think that's something significant. That's for a different discussion another day, but this it's interesting to see that again, right? That caught my attention. But when we look at the word below, right, we see that there's this aspect of to mix, mingle, confuse, and confound. Right? To mix or mingle, to confuse, to 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 give provender or feed, right? To mix oneself to fade away, right? In the primitive root, it means by implication to mix, 
to confound, fade, mingle, mix, right, or to temper. So when you're when you're looking at the context of this aspect of this spirit of, of Babylon, you're looking at this spirit of Bilal and this aspect of Babel, Babel the, the common word that I want you all to see is this aspect of confuse, right? But not just the word confused. I want you guys to see like the how that's attached to the what, right? The what is confused and the how is to mix, right? To mix. But what is mixed, right? Like, like what does it mean when this confusion is done by mixing and, and, and this mingling and this different thing? Like what is the father talking about when this language is used to describe the spirit of how Babylon operates? Right. And if you guys remember from some of the lessons that we did, I think it was back around February where we talked about this reality of the fact that Constantine was not a believer in Christ. Right. It's a common narrative that he was a follower of Christ. But when you really look into the history and the root of it. Right. For the first 300 years of the early church, a lot of the stuff that we see is 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 not it was not there. Right. Christ and the early followers, the earlier disciples and the earlier congregants and the different assemblies that they had. Right. They stuck strictly to what they had observed. Christ and his and his, his apostles and disciples living out, breathing, reading and teaching and preaching. Right. When Constantine had this desire to 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 bring everyone on one accord, right? Not not on the one accord that the body of Christ talks about, where we're all of one Lord, one faith, one baptism, but that 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 Babylonian aspect, right? That that aspect of bringing everyone on one accord to elevate themselves above the highest heights of the Most High, right? He did it through this. He did it through leveraging a faith system that he felt like was easier to attach to. And spread and infuse elements of his faith and these other forms of worship to bring this aspect of coexistence, right? This cohesion, this tolerance, and this mixing and this mingling of things that the Most High Himself said He should not be mixed, right? That's why the spirit of Babylon tries to separate the New Testament from the Old Testament. That's why the spirit of Babylon tries to create this this taboo around looking into anything that predated certain errors as far as the new testament text because there's a lot of stuff that exposes the pattern of how the enemy is operating if the babylon if the if the spirit of babylon right the spirit of Bilal, which is operating to bring confusion through mixing things in together and mingling these things together to create this confusion the only way you're going to understand what is being mixed in that is not supposed to be mixed in is you have to read and study the text. Not opinions, not people saying, I feel like this applies and that doesn't apply and different things like that. You have to study the prophecies, study the prophecies, look what was written, right? Mm -hmm. what, are, what, what did the father say? Like, look at the characteristics of God that's outlined in his law, right? Because he says, this is what I like and this is what I don't like. Is this aspect that helps you build discernment so you can see what's going on in the earth, right? But this spirit that doesn't want to be exposed is going to tell you not to look at the thing that's going to give you understanding so you can recognize it when you see it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Amen. So with that being said, I want us to go ahead and read. I want us to go ahead and, and jump into to the Bible verses that we have, which is Isaiah 13 and Isaiah 14. But I want to read Isaiah 13 first, right? All right, so Isaiah chapter 13, is, and we're just going to read, we're going to read the whole thing and just and just listen to what the Father's saying, right? Listen to it, listen to the word, listen to the mouth of God, right? This is the prophecy that is coming through the prophet Isaiah, all right? And this is chapter 13. It says, verse one, the burden of Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amos did see. Lift up a banner upon the high mountain, exalt the voice unto them, shake the hand that they may go into the gates of the nobles. I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones for my anger, even them that rejoice in my highness. 
The noise of a multitude in the mountains, like as of a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts mustereth the host of the battle. They come from a far country, from the end of heaven, even the Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. All right, I want you guys to take note of these verses three through five, because we're going to come back and revisit that, right? Verse six. How ye for the day of the Lord is at hand, it shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrow shall take a hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another, and their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. Right? That's echoing what we see in Matthew 24 and Revelations. Right? And picking back up at verse 11. And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man the golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore, I will shake the heavens and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. And it shall be as the chase wrote and as a sheep that no man takes up. They shall every man turn to his own people and flee everyone into his own land. Everyone that is found shall be thrust through and everyone that is joined unto them shall fall by the sword. Right. Verse 15. This is echoing what's talked about in Revelations when it says, be you separate, lest you receive of her plagues. Right. Verse 16, their children also shall be dashed to pieces before their eyes, their houses shall be spoiled, and their wives ravished. Behold, I will stir up the Medes against them, which shall not regard silver, and as for gold, they shall not delight in it. Their bows also shall dash the young men to pieces, and they shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes shall not spare children. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. But wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures, and owls shall dwell there, and satyrs shall dance there. And the wild beasts of the islands shall cry in their desolate houses, and dragons in their pleasant palaces. And her time is near to come, and her days shall not be prolonged. Right? And we'll keep going to Isaiah 14. And I'll just read verses 1 through 22, so bear with me. All right, Isaiah chapter 14, verses 1 through 22. It says, For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob, and will yet choose Israel and set them in their own land, and the strangers shall be joined with them, right? And they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. And the people shall take them and bring them to their place, and the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord for servants and handmaids, and they shall take them captives whose captives they were, and they shall rule over their oppressors. Verse 3, And it shall come to pass in the day that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow and from thy fear and from the hard bondage where you were made to serve. You shall take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, How has the oppressor ceased, the golden city ceased? The Lord has broken off the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. He who smote the people in wrath with a continuous stroke, he that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and none, hin none hindereth. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee and the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since thou art laid down, no fellow has come up against us. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee. Even all the chief ones of the earth, it hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. All they shall speak and say unto you, Are you also become weak as us? Are you becoming like unto us? Your pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of your vials, the worm is spread under you, and the worm covers you. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. 
I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall, you shall be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see you shall narrowly look upon you and consider you, saying, Is this the man that made the earth tremble and did shake kingdoms? That the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners. All the kings of the nations, even all of them, lie in glory, every one in his own house. But you are cast out of your grave like an abominable branch, and as the raiment of those that are slain, thrust through with the sword that go down to the stones of the pit, as a carcass trodden under feet. You should not be joined with them in burial because you have destroyed your land and slain your people. And seed of evildoers shall never be renowned. Prepare slaughter for his children for the iniquity of their fathers, that they do not rise nor possess the land, nor fill the place of the world with cities. Verse 22, For I will rise up against them, saith the Lord of hosts, and cut off from Babylon the name and remnant and son and nephew, saith the Lord. I will also make it a possession for the bittern and pools of water, and I will sweep it with the besom of destruction, saith the Lord of hosts. Right? Verse 22 is what I was talking about when I was reading and studying, and this is the aspect that stood out about this remnant, right? This remnant that belongs to Babylon as well. All right? So we have this aspect where there's this remnant that belongs to the body of Christ, and then we also have this remnant of Babylon. So, considering this, you have to always check the fruit, right? You always recognize the Spirit by its fruit. That's why the Holy Spirit, or the Most High God, bears fruit in a believer of Christ. Any spirit that's operating regardless of what type of spirit it is it always bears fruit and fruit is the characteristics of i guess the the person of that spirit if that makes sense right like who that spirit is or what that spirit is or what that spirit represents that's the fruit it bears right mm -hmm. so you always have to check the fruit right that's why the scripture says try the spirit by the spirit right try the spirit measure the spirit of that's operating against the word of the most high right yes. Measure the spirit and the characteristics and, and what an, an individual is putting off, right? Test it against the scriptures because that is the fruit that allows you to understand what the nature of that spirit is, right? Mm -hmm. The spirit of the Holy God of Israel is not going to lead you to sin. It doesn't lead you to disobedience, right? That's what, that's, that's what scriptures talk about, false prophets and different things like that. The spirit of God is not going to lead you to violate the word of God. That's how you know it's not from him. Mm -hmm. Right? Any spirit that's operating outside of the scriptures is always going to try to lead you to compromise in some form or fashion because when you create a form of compromise, what you begin to do is you begin to open up the door for compromise. Right? We're not, I'm, not, I'm not talking about this concept of grace, right? Because we understand what grace is. I'm talking about this aspect where the devil loves to give this, he loves to do this baby step approach to get you to continue down a path where you're so far away from obedience, you don't even realize how you got there, right? The same way the scripture says, here little, there little, and talking about line upon line and precept upon precept, Satan uses the same tactic. He wants you to compromise here a little bit, then he wants you to compromise there a little bit, and the more he keeps getting you a little bit there, here a little bit, there a little bit, it turns into a lot. And before you know it, you've, you're so mixed up and confused because you've mixed in a lot of these different things that don't belong in the life of a believer or a child of the Most High God, right? So anytime you're presented with a situation, anytime you're presented with a thing, you have to look at the fruit of what's going on, right? Is it fruit that leads to godliness, obedience, or repentance? Or is it fruit that leads to lawlessness and rebellion? Is there fruit that leads you to dive deeper into the scriptures and to, and to gives you a desire to want to apply what you're reading and studying? Or is it leading you to a place of where you want to start cherry picking and, 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 and leaning on your own understanding, right? Which is a form of self-righteousness, right? Do you want to be righteous by your own standards or by the standards of Christ? And we can't forget that Christ was the word made flesh. So if Christ is our standard, you have to understand what that means, right? Christ is our standard. Right? His blood speaks and atones for our sins. 
But the standard that we're looking at, we're not looking at our brothers and sisters in Christ as a standard because because they're walk though they're of this spirit because of of their faith in Christ, right? They are still prone to sin because they inhabit the flesh until everything is fulfilled, right? Right? That, that temptation is always laying at the door waiting. Right, like the father had taught, told Cain, if I'm not mistaken. So it's like we don't we don't measure ourselves against one another. That's why the scripture says we're foolish when we compare ourselves with one another. We measure ourselves against Christ. And even though we understand there's a level of perfection that we that we walk that he walked in, when you aim at something, when you aim at a higher bar, you're always gonna you're gonna make progress, right? What do they say? Like like you are the company you keep. If you if you hang around people that have a certain mindset. And they feel like they're never going to go anywhere or they're not going to do anything. If you don't escape from that, that, that same environment, you'll begin to become what's around you. So when our focus is Christ and we understand that that's what we should be, that that's who we should be emulating or that's who we should be striving after, then you're always going to make progress. You're always going to make progress, right? And there's fruits that come, like there's fruit of your life and that change that is evident that the Holy Spirit is with you. Right. And it's this fruit that helps us understand the nature of the spirit that's at work within you. If that makes sense. Right. But considering that. You have to understand that when Isaiah 14 is breaking down this concept as far as Lucifer and identifying Lucifer as the king of Babylon. Then that's how you understand that when Isaiah 13 is talking about Babylon and the Medes and the Persians and stuff like that. Though those were real authentic nations, there's also a spiritual component that's going on there, right? But this is important because there's something that I said that we're going to talk about as far as Isaiah Isaiah 3 through 5, right? But I want to share this because I believe it will give clarity as far as how the father is dealing with the spirit of Babylon. We know like the day of judgment comes, right? At some point where the father himself will deal with Lucifer and different things like that because Christ dealt with Christ Christ stripped him of his authority for the believer in Christ at the cross, right? He gave us power over him in, in the kingdom of darkness by faith through the gift of the Holy Spirit, right? But through all of that, we understand that Lucifer and his kingdom still operates in this earth until the great day of judgment comes, right? The cross was a day of judgment for the kingdom of darkness, but it was not the prophesied great day of judgment that we see spoken of by Christ himself in Matthew and Revelation and all these other books of the Bible like Ezekiel and Isaiah, different things like that, right? So before the great day of judgment, there's all these things that have to happen. So so how does the Most High deal with it, right? Well, he said in verses three through five, let me pull it back up. Isaiah 13, verses 3 through 5. He says, I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones for mine anger, even them that rejoice in my highness. The noise of a multitude in the mountains, the noise of a multitude in the mountains, like as of a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together, the Lord of hosts mustereth the hosts of battle. They come from a far country, from the end of heaven, even the Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land, right? Now, there's this aspect that I want you guys to see, right? So the word that was used here, let me make sure I'm seeing the right one. The word that was used here is the same word that we know is the Holy Spirit, right? It's the same word that we know was used for the Holy Spirit. And it's this word right here. Kadesh, right? What it means is to consecrate, sanctify, prepare, dedicate, be hallowed, be holy, be sanctified, be separate, right? To be set apart, be consecrated, to show oneself sacred or majestic, right? To set apart as sacred. All of this stuff, it just deals with devoted, consecrated, and all these other things, right? It also deals with this concept of being appointed. And what I want you guys to understand is when he is saying that I have a, commanded my sanctified ones, he's pretty much saying I've, I've appointed my sanctified ones and called my strong ones, my mighty ones, for my anger, even them that rejoice in my highness, right? These are the ones who delight in seeking the face of the Father, right? 
And he's gathering them as his weapons of his indignation, right? But we understand it's talking about the spirit. So we see this confirmed in Jeremiah chapter 51, verses 20 through 26. So Jeremiah 51, 20 through 26, he says, You are my battle axe and my weapons of war. For with you I will break the nation in pieces. With you I will destroy kingdoms. With you I will break in pieces the horse and its rider. With you I will break in pieces the chariot and its rider. With you also I will break in pieces man and woman. With you I will break in pieces old and young. With you I will break in pieces the young man and the maiden. Verse 23. With you also I will break in pieces the shepherd and his flock. With you I will break in pieces the farmer and his yoke of oxen. And with you I will break in pieces governors and rulers. 24. And I will repay Babylon and all the inhabitants of Chaldea for all the evil they have done in Zion in your sight, says the Lord. Verse 25. Behold, I am against you, O destroying mountain, who destroys all the earth, says the Lord. And I will stretch out my hand against you, roll you down from the rocks, and make you a burnt mountain. They shall not take from you a stone for a corner, nor a stone for a foundation, but you shall be desolate forever, says the Lord. Right? So what, what does this mean when the Most High God of Israel is telling his people, right, his sanctified ones, his consecrated ones, his devoted ones, his appointed ones, that you are his battle axe and his weapon of war. Well, for one, we know that the scriptures tell us that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty to pulling down strongholds, right? But when we engage in this, this, this aspect of these battles spiritually, the Father is telling us through Jeremiah what the fruit of that looks like, right? These are the things that you that occur when we engage in this warfare in the spirit. But this is what the Father desires and has appointed his those who are, are consecrated and, and set apart unto his purposes. This is what he's appointed us for, right? This is what he's appointed us for. So in this season... And it's, it's wild because it sounds it like it's starting to connect with what we talked about. It sounds like the same thing that the Spirit was saying last time. You have to understand what type of instrument of war you are in this season. Right? If we know that, it's, that the, the Babylonic spirit is in operation at this moment, and all of this confusion and mingling and everything is going on, like, like I don't even need to go too deep into all this. Like, you know the type of confusion that's out here right now. Right? But if he desires to use you as an instrument of war, finding out what type of instrument you are, right? Because there's many instruments, but it's all it's, it all makes this a beautiful sound when it sounds, right? But what type of instrument are you and how does the Father desire you to war, right? This is where we start seeing the real battle, right? This battle and this, this, this aspect of when the Father starts to show you who you are in his kingdom, and Satan comes to try to suppress it, right? Because if you are in Christ because of your faith, and you are empowered by the Holy Spirit, and the Most High has begun his cleaning process of stripping everything off of you that was imposed upon you from the world and the things of this world and the cares of this life and these lies of the enemy, Right, if he's been if he's begin taking all of that off of you and trying to reveal to you who you really are in the spirit, right? Then you are positioning yourself to walk in the purpose and the plan that the Father has ordained from you from before the foundations of the earth, right? From from before you were in the womb. From before he formed you when he said he knew you, he had a purpose assigned to your life, right? And if the scriptures tell us that we are his weapons of war against the spiritual kingdom of darkness, then you have to ask yourself, what does that look like for you in the situation, in the sense of this, this battle with this Babylonic spirit? If that makes sense, right? Like, we sometimes we get so focused on, like, like, like any crisis and stuff like that where, where we forget, like, yes, all that stuff is true, but, but as we're leading up to these different things, what does the most high desire of us to do, right? If he desires to use me as a weapon against this Babylonic spirit, right? How does this spirit operate? The spirit operates through creating confusion. 
How does the spirit create confusion? By mixing and mingling those things which are not supposed to be mixed and mingled. That's why the Most High said, when you see how they worship their gods, don't worship me like that. I'm a holy God. Those other gods, I don't know what they are, but they're not me. So whatever you see them doing, don't bring that into my house. Right? I'm giving you a code of conduct to govern yourself so you can, so when people see you, they don't say, who raised them? They say, man, they, they, you bring honor to my name. You bring glory to my kingdom. Because there's, there's a difference between you as my child compared to the children of Baal, right? So if the father desires to, to, to call up his remnant in his hour, right? One thing you have to understand and, and why he would even bring this understanding is because like if, if, if Isaiah teaches us that Babylon itself has a remnant, right? It, it would make sense that if the most high is gathering his remnant to engage in spiritual warfare to make sure as many people can receive of Christ as possible, then it only makes sense that Satan is mustering up his remnant too. Right? The spirit of Babylon is mustering up his remnant too. And that's where you see these push. That's that's where you see a lot of the tension then throughout the earth, right? A lot of this stuff, we give so much credit to the enemy. A lot of this stuff, man, a lot of it, sometimes we forget that Satan needs permission to, to operate how he's operating, right? But a lot of this yeah. stuff is prophesied. But some of that tension and stuff that we're seeing in the earth and the conflicts and stuff that are brewing is a result of what's happening in the spirit, right? So you have the remnant body of Christ. And that's, that's, that's Hebrew and Gentile that are coming into knowledge and understanding of who Christ is, salvation by grace through faith, but understand the significance of obedience based on the words of Christ in Matthew 7, right? But then you also have this, 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 uh, what do you call it? I guess rousing or, or rallying up or, um, like, like you have this rallying up of this, of this remnant of lawless, of lawlessness. And, and it's wild, it's wild because like this, this is what, this is what I'm seeing, right? Like, so the more it's crazy man i can't think of the scripture but i remember i i know there's a verse that talks about like there's a time where he magnifies his law right and and as i'm seeing this stuff happen in the earth and we're witnessing this acceleration of these biblical prophecies right that that it doesn't mean stuff going downhill tomorrow but like it's giving us an indication of where we are the more you see the Most High fulfill the prophecy where he talked about magnifying his law and writing his law on hearts and turning people to his commandments and different things like that to bear witness in the earth, Amen. pay attention. You, it's, it's like you see a direct correlation of individuals that are being raised up to directly oppose that. And it's, it's, it's not by accident. And some individuals don't, don't even realize like that's what's happening. They're like, like Peter, it's like, it's like the example of Peter and Christ. Right? Christ was obedient until the point of death. And then at a place where where he knew that he had to be obedient. And, and one of the most trying points of his obedience, somebody was raised up and challenged his obedience in that in that very moment. Right? But we see this, we see this happening in the earth. And it's like it's like a conflict. It's like conflict. But it's a remnant of the body of Christ, and then there's a remnant of those who are lawless. Lawlessness is rebellion, right? And rebellion is at the sin of witchcraft. Rebellion is a form of self-righteousness where you start to get in a context as far as like Aleister Crowley and different things like that. Do as thou wilt will be the whole of the law. Basically, if you judge it to be good, then it's good. If you judge it to be bad, it's bad. And and I've, I've noticed I, a lot of times I used to look at like people who are outside the body of Christ a lot. When I first was coming into the, the knowledge and understanding of like Aleister Crowley and, and, and how the devil used him to set certain things up, right? But the thing that is deeper than that is like the scripture constantly realigns our focus and says, don't look at those who are outside the body of Christ. 
right? Like the Lord himself would judge them. That's what Corinthians teaches us. That said, we judge those which are within the body. And so because we're so focused on looking outside of those who claim the name of Christ, we forget to examine those who are within inside, right? We examine ourselves first, right? Because we're not the standard Christ is. So we have to make sure we're on point while holding one another accountable, right? But there's this aspect that I'm seeing where it's like, uh, man, it's, it's escaping my thought. Father, I pray that you bring it back, right? There's this aspect, man, it just, it just escaped my thought process as far as what I was saying. There it is. Thank you, thank you, Father. There's this aspect that is within the body of Christ. There's an element in the body of Christ that that walks in rebellion and doesn't. I don't even believe they realize that they're walking in rebellion because they're comparing themselves with the world. So, and and my prayer is that this makes sense when I'm about to explain this, right? So there's a there's an aspect of believer in the body of Christ that looks at the world and judges the sin of the world. And uses, man, this is crazy. It's making so much sense. They use the the sin of the world as a measure for their life instead of instead of the standard of scripture. Instead of using Christ as the mirror and, and to to measure up where they are with Christ based on the scriptures, right? And I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about obedience, right? In this point, they'll judge the the quality of their obedience by comparing it to a lawless world that is outside the body of Christ, that is outside faith in Christ, that is outside any type of biblical morals. So they'll say, oh, if that's what the world is like, as long as I'm not like that, then I'm good, right? It's a form of self-righteousness because they are establishing a righteousness that they have deemed appropriate that is outside of the scriptural context. If that makes sense. Mm. But that is the breeding. That's the that's the that's the type of heart Satan needs to produce rebellion and lawlessness against the holy God. Because you're because you are judging your obedience or disobedience against a lawless people. If you are lawless, it's easier for you to be blinded to your lawlessness because you don't recognize you're, you're not looking at the true standard that you should be using to, to examine yourself to see if you're of the faith. You're, you're basing the good works that you have established for yourself against really like a, a, a standard that we're not even supposed to be considering because it's, it has nothing to do with faith in Christ, if that makes sense. So all of that being said and considering that, you we have to really be discerning of the seasons that we're in and really follow the direction of the Most High, right? We have to test everything with Scripture because there's many false, like again, as we talked about this remnant of the body of Christ that's being raised up, Satan is raising up his remnant, right? So there's false prophets. It prophesied that false prophets are going to be everywhere. They're going to be everywhere, right? And they're going to say, I am the Christ and different things like that. And the funny thing is even Satan even distorts that aspect of it. He distorts that aspect of it because we believe that we, we misinterpret that scripture to believe that there's literally going to be thousands of people out here saying, follow me, I'm Jesus, right? Like, like we see all of these movies and these parodies, and you think about this different thing, but, but what people don't understand is Christ said, Christ said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, right? So if Christ said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, trust this righteousness. Then what that helps us to understand is this. If he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, then what we have to understand is when the scriptures prophesy and say that there's going to be many saying, I am Christ, what that means is there's going to be many that are in the earth saying, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Or when it says, like, they'll say, look, he's over there, or he's over there, or he's in the wilderness, he says, don't go. That's the equivalent of saying, look, that's the way. That's the way. This is the way. This is the truth. This is the life. And we see that everywhere right now. But all of these are perversions. Right? And 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 I want I want to show y'all something, right? Can y'all still see can y'all still see these scriptures? Can y'all see my screen? 
I want to make sure. Sorry, I don't know no. if y'all can see that. No, we don't. All right, so it's one of these. Where is it? All right, it's this verse right here, right? So this is this. Let me show you something, right? It's this aspect where the scriptures was talking about, like the wicked being judged for their iniquity and different things like that. So when all of this lawlessness is going on, and and Satan is trying to create all this confusion, he's trying to create this perversion, right? Because when he's doing all of this. He's creating individuals that, that are deemed wicked in the eyes of the Father. They're deemed criminal. They're deemed hostile to God, right? Because they're going against the Father and don't realize it, right? But there's this aspect of this word right here that deals with, uh, like, iniquity, right? He get, he's, trying to, he's trying to create a situation where believers or are falling into this pattern of iniquity, right? And I'm highlighting that word because the word that is used for iniquity at its root, it means perversity, depravity, right? Guilt, right? So we see these different aspects of it. But ultimately, the biggest thing is, is this concept of like perversity and depravity, right? The enemy is consistently trying to raise up his prophets, because he wants to get us in a place where he wants to get the children of God in a place where they are work, they're they're walking in perversion, right? They're walking in perversion. He wants us to walk in perversion because, in the eyes of God, this perversion of the truth is iniquity, and that iniquity makes us hostile to God, because Hebrews ten says when we walk in willful disobedience. Right? Like the blood doesn't speak for that. Now how grace interacts with that, that's 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 a that's a that's a conversation that that goes a long ways, right? As as far as how that plays out. But the biggest thing I'm talking about here is just like this 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 intentional perversion and distortion of things that have nothing to do with the reality of the truth of the scriptures. It has nothing to do with the reality of the grace of the Father, it has nothing to do with the reality of why Christ came and shed his blood, right? This is where we see these debates about like abortion and different things like that. Or this is where we start to see these debates about uh, 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 just a lot of different things, right? About like like fornication and or sex outside of marriage. Like all these different debates occur, right? And a lot of times it happens in the body of Christ. The reason why these things have even gotten to this point as far as an issue of discussion is because of these false prophets that have risen up. That's why I said if a false prophet raises up to to and says this dream is going to has this dream or, or prophesies this and it happens. It says, but then after that happens, they tell you to go follow something that's contrary to the scriptures. It says you don't listen to them. Right. And the reason why that's important is ill because I read the Torah portion this morning and I was going to share it in the chat. One thing that stood out to me is unless I misread it from my understanding of what I was reading, you have an individual that was being sought out like as a as a diviner, right? Or as a sorcerer, right? But this individual who was being sought out as a diviner or a sorcerer was still able to receive a prophetic word from God, which is wild to me. Right, so it makes sense when the scriptures in Deuteronomy say the Lord your God is testing you, right? Because a false prophet can still hear from God and speak the truth according to the Father. So what you have to look for is after that happens, what is the fruit of it? Right? Do they do they do they speak a word of truth and then they cause you to yield and submit to the Father? And, and walk in more obedience and application of the scriptures, or do they lead you somewhere else, right? But a lot of the confusion we see, and a lot of this distortion and, and distorted and, and twisting and perverted reality is a result of these false prophets that have been raised up whose purpose is to mislead, right? Because they're being led by this Babylonian spirit, because this Babylonian spirit wants to confuse everyone.
because confusion allows the enemy to continue to advance his his agenda right so this is just a side nugget that i came across when i was studying right when the scriptures was talking about like he will be raised he'll raise the means up against him i found it was interesting because when we're talking about like the prophetic aspect and i looked into the origin or like who the memes are now and it connects with iran right and i remember from classes and courses i've taken in, in like world religions classes in the past it talked that we learned about how some of the tension between like western nations in the middle east are like generational conflicts because there's this babylonian mindset that that it, that we talked about before like with the greek hellenism and, and how this concept of coexisting and like blending everything together to kind of like impose a new mindset is 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 something that actually caused a lot of these mid middle eastern regions to lose some of their power so there's like an inherent conflict between some of these nation states in the middle east and the western ideologies because it was this this western system that approached them as a western, western system that was that was used in such a way that caused them to um to lose authority right but I felt like that was interesting because we know that there's a lot of conflicts and different things like that that are prophesied to occur. So it's interesting when you look into the history as it pertains to even the, the, the word that was prophesied from the Holy Scriptures as far as how things are going to play out. Mm. Right? Because that tension is still there. And there's and there and, and and but if you really look at what some of that tension is outside of the spiritual things and what the and what the Most High Himself is prophesied right outside of the prophecies that are in the Bible, right? There there there's historical accuracy, but you also see like there there's uh. I guess there's relational history. If that's the term, if I'm saying the term correctly, like there's there's a history of of interaction and relationship that shows the framework for what was prophesied to occur. And that's why you see some of the sanctions and the stuff that you see of like occurring, like like all of that stuff is prophesied. It's just there's this tension, right? But you see it when it's when in Isaiah when it says like they won't be moved by gold and silver and different things like that. Like some of the sanctions that are that are affecting some of the countries that are outside of, of the Western Hemisphere or the Western um, train of thought, the sanctions affect them to a degree. But at the same time, that ha that's is that is not effective at stopping them from doing what they're doing. Right, it's not effective from stopping them from building their militaries. It's not effective from stopping them pursuing certain programs. They're still doing what they want to do. Right, so it just shows that it's only a matter of time before, at some point, what is prophesied tra uh, actually transfers or or manifests in the earth. Right, and I think that's noteworthy because it's in the scriptures. And so, outside of looking at the spiritual aspect of Babylon, I just felt like that's something that believers should be aware of. Right, so. Go, you can go look into it and, and do some of your own research. But um, outside of that, just some of the final thoughts I have is, uh, as far as everything is concerned is just this, this concept of just recognizing this spirit that's at work and just and just why, why it's functioning. And the reason why I say that is because when you can recognize the spirit, when when you can see the spirit that's operating, it keeps you from getting it keeps you from being blinded by looking at the natural, right? It keeps you from being blinded by looking at those things that the devil might use to to distract you. If that makes sense. Because if there is a we know there so and, and this is why I say this, and I I'm praying this makes sense, right? There are some people who will say because Babylon, the, the historical Babylon has already fallen and collapsed, right? then that prophecy in Isaiah is already fulfilled. But they're looking with their natural eye because Isaiah 14 goes right behind that to identify Lucifer as a king of Babylon, right? So you have to understand the characteristics of the spirit of Babylon so that way you don't get locked in into looking for a single location or a single na uh, a single nation state or something to say, okay, this is Babylon. Because everyone always tries to like, there's all these little debates about well, I think this nation is Babylon, or I think this nation is Babylon. The reality is, is, is any nation that is operating based on the fruit of the spirits that we just talked about and how the scriptures outline the mindset and the pattern of operating of this Babylonic spirit is, is Babylon. 
That's when Revelation starts talking about mystery Babylon. That's what it's talking about. It says it's a mystery because the Babylonian spirit or the Babylonian system of thinking and pattern of thinking spiritually operates in many nations. But how the devil does it is based on the nation that that spirit is operating in. It adapts. It adapts how it's presenting itself based on the culture that is engaged with so it can be most effective. Because the Babylonic spirit desires to create confusion to impede the gospel and to advance the kingdom of darkness. If that makes sense, right? But when you're aware of how the spirit operates, then you can you can recognize it when you see it. Right? And this also helps you to, to just be aware of what's going on spiritually. And it also helps you to be aware as far or at least make some sense like I mean, we all understand, honestly, what's going on in the earth and different things like that for the most part. But it helps you, if anything, it'll help you explain it to somebody else, right? And different things like that. But um, that's all I got. So I'll go ahead and um, I'll pray this out. And then we can open it up for um, any questions, comments, or thoughts of just discussion. Um, I'm curious to hear you guys' thoughts. And then I'll check the chat and try to catch up, all right? Um, so, yeah. So, Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you. Um, Father, we thank you for tonight. Father, we thank you for, um, Father, the word. We thank you for the scriptures. Father, I pray um, if there's any way that I said um, more or less than you can guide me in this word.